All right, everybody coming in from the waiting room, uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Joe Aiello. I'm the National Field Coordinator for the Rail Pastor Association. And, and again, welcome to uh, another, another event in our series of ongoing uh, um, webinar, monthly webinars. Uh, we have a very uh, timely topic uh, to cover today, uh, metrics and standards, and what that means for passenger rail and advocacy uh, across the country. So I want to introduce uh, our president and CEO, Jim Matthews. And then uh, he'll be followed by uh, Elizabeth Brubeck and Yoel Weiss, both from Amtrak for our future presentation. And then uh, the three of them will be joined by our VP of Government Affairs, Sean Jeans Gale, for a Q&A. Uh, be sure to make sure your cameras and cameras are off and mics are muted for the entire presentation. We will have the chat going before and after presentations, just so we can keep everyone focused. And then uh, when it comes to Q&A, please uh, put your questions, uh, your relevant questions in the chats. Uh, and then we'll get them, uh, we'll try to answer them uh, throughout the uh, the end of the event here. So without further ado, I welcome um, Jim Matthews, our present CEO. Super, Joe, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, you know, most every month we bring special guests to our webinars to share their insights with our members, our supporters, the general public. And today I am excited to be joined by two very special guests to talk about one of the biggest problems we face today as passengers. And I'm talking about late trains, late trains. It's bad out there and it's getting worse. Unfortunately, late trains are a horrible reality for the gas shocked Americans who are giving Amtrak a try for the first time. Now, the most current data I have shows that some of Amtrak's most popular trains are running 86% late. And the average Amtrak passenger in May had 108 minutes of delay. That's, that's just an average, that's nearly two hours. Southwest Chief was on time 13.2% of the time. It was 9% worse in May than the 12 month average. Uh, the Sunset, dismal, 13% on time performance. California Zephyr, same. Silver Star was on time only 16% of the time in May and that was 38% worse than the 12 month average for that train. So one of my big fears, of course, is that the never again crowd will undoubtedly grow. And there's lots of reasons for trains to be late and sometimes they're Amtrak's fault, but the vast overwhelming majority of the time, you can point your finger in a single direction, freight train interference. But today we have a new remedy at our disposal, enforcement of the newly enacted federal passenger rail metrics and standards. Now, these rules were scary enough to the host railroads that they went all the way to the Supreme Court twice to block them. But in 2017, the Supreme Court had finally had enough. They refused to hear the case again. That cleared the way for the Federal Railroad Administration to draft and to publish metrics and standards designed to help the Surface Transportation Board enforce your right to be on time with no intervention needed from the Attorney General. So FRA adopted the final rule in the waning days of the Trump administration, and now they're fully in place. And we really hope they're ready to make a difference for all of us who want our trains to run on time. So today, uh, my two special guests are here to help us take a deep dive into what's behind late trains and what we might all be able to do about it. Uh, Elizabeth Brubeck joined Amtrak a year ago in the host railroad group, working on improving performance of Amtrak trains on host railroads. Before coming to Amtrak, she spent the bulk of her career on the freight rail side at two separate class one railroads, managing joint facility agreements involving services and assets shared between railroads. Now, most recently, she spent more than four years with Union Pacific in their Southern region office in Spring, Texas. And then before UP, Elizabeth was at CSX for 10 years in Jacksonville. And we also have Joel Weiss, who is the senior principal in the host railroad group working to improve performance on host railroads. Now, Yoel came to Amtrak nearly four years ago after working in other industries, handling operations and logistics management and identifying and improving, uh, con implementing continuous improvement opportunities uh, wherever he worked. So Lizbeth, Yoel, thank you so much for being here with us today. And uh, we will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Jim. This is Elizabeth Brubeck and I'm joined with Yoel. Um, and we would like to provide an update uh, to your members uh, on where we are at with the uh, FRA's final rule. Um, if you could move to the next slide, please. 
So this is the agenda in, in what I plan to talk about uh, with regard to the final rule, uh, where we are at with the schedule certification process, uh, the non-binding dispute resolution process outlined in the Federal uh, Railroad Administration's final rule, as well as the actual performance versus the minimum standard of 80% customer on-time performance. Uh, we'll also look at some uh, actual delay data and uh, charts, and we'll take questions um, from you guys at the end. Next slide, please. So the final rule established the metrics and minimum standards for intercity passenger rail service. The customer on-time performance metric is the percentage of all customers who arrive at their training point no later than 15 minutes after their published published arrival time reported by train and by route. That's the metric. The minimum standard is 80% customer on time performance for any two consecutive calendar quarters. Other new metrics introduced include the ridership data metric for which Amtrak provides monthly data to the host railroads, and also the certification schedule metric that reports a list of certified, uncertified, and disputed schedules by host and by train. These reports are also provided to the FRA. Next slide, please. So you may have seen this uh, timeline. Uh, it is embedded within the final rule and uh, it has been over a year and a half since the publication of the final rule, which occurred on November 16th, 2020. Um, and the numbers along the bottom axis of the, the timeline indicate the months after the rule was published. So that one is actually December, which is one month after the November publication. And so it outlined uh, certain obligations that uh, the Amtrak had it to provide uh, with regard to the process. Um, the stars indicate that the certified schedule metric was reported to the FRA uh, for six months after the publication, um, and then 12 months, and then annually thereafter. Um, in June of 2021, uh, with regard to uncertified schedules, um, the, the host with uh, uncertified schedules and Amtrak would jointly submit a, a monthly letter to, to certain uh, government agencies uh, with regard to the status of those uncertified schedules. And so this is uh, shown in, and we have well past uh, the timeline and uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more detail as we proceed. Next slide, please. So this, the, certifi the certified schedule metric that's included in the final rule uh, classified the schedules that we have into three separate buckets. Um, certified is a published train schedule that Amtrak and the host railroad jointly certified as, a, as is aligned with the customer on time performance metric in minimum standard. It was effective uh, six months after the publication of the rule. Um, and uncertified is also a published train schedule that has not been reported as certified or disputed. So it's in a, a limbo land. Uh, the disputed bucket uh, is a published train schedule for which a specific change is sought and, and that is the only subject of a non-binding dispute resolution process uh, which would be led by a neutral third party and involves Amtrak in one or more host railroads. Um, the disputed schedules were effective nine months following the publication of the final rule. Next slide please. All right, so this may, you may have to squint and, and look at this, but this is the certification status for uh, all our routes uh, in the different buckets that I mentioned previously, the certified, uncertified, and disputed. So you'll see the certified column, we have 94% of our total schedules that are certified. So we did some amazing work with the host railroads to get to that point. Uh, we do have 18 schedules that are uh, uncertified at this time. That's only 2% of the total. And uh, lastly, we have the 41 schedules disputed uh, mainly by the class one carriers, uh, which account for 4% of the total. Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned the uncertified schedules. Uh, there is the process that for the uncertified schedule, the Amtrak and the host railroad would submit a monthly joint letter outlining the train schedule at hand Amtrak and the host railroad's respective position on the uh, disagreement and a plan expected date to resolve the agreement. 
The monthly joint letter is signed by each respective CEOs uh, and is sent to several federal agencies and government officials, including each U.S. Senator and U.S. Representative whose district is served by the train, the Secretary of uh, Transportation, Mr. Pete Buttigieg, and the STB and many other representatives. The purpose of the letter uh, is to make policymakers aware of the status of the train and to help ensure that there is a sense of urgency maintained to resolve the disagreement. As mentioned in the previous slide, Metro North is the only host that we have remaining with uh, uncertified schedules. And Metro North's position is that they will not certify a schedule that is not currently running. Um, Amtrak, uh, our position is that we that the schedules were running and published at the time of the final rule publication. Therefore, um, we must continue this uh, monthly obligation to, to write notify letters uh, of the status of the schedule being uncertified until it is certified. Um, next slide, please. So with that regard to the disputed schedule uh, category, um, they can go undergo a non-binding dispute resolution process. Uh, this process is not fully uh, described in the final rule. So the parties, the host railroad and Amtrak must negotiate how uh, this process will uh, proceed. Um, and Amtrak has proposed a common process for all hosts um, and hosts have individually uh, proposed to change that, that process. And so uh, dis the non-binding dispute resol resolution process is similar to a mediation uh, and, and governed by a third party, party neutral. Um, so the disputed schedules nonetheless uh, became subject to the final rule uh, in metrics minimum standards. Uh, the schedules began measurement on October 1st, which was nine months after the publication of the rule. Um, so the class one uh, railroads for which we have disputed schedules are CN, Norfolk Southern, BNSF and Union Pacific. Um, CSX and, and Canadian Pacific, we have 100% certified our schedules with those class ones. Next slide, please. So our, our team at, at Amtrak, we uh, have, this is our process uh, since the implementation of the final rule. We are looking at the certified and uncertified uh, train schedules. They began measurement uh, beginning July 1st of last year. Um, and the disputed train started their measurement October 1st of, of last year. And so the, the requirement is we monitor the train's performance, uh, customer on-time performance for two consecutive quarters, after which time those two consecutive quarters pass, we look to see are any of them eligible and, and performing below that minimum standard, um, at, at which point uh, we can seek the, um, the STB to investigate uh, the the, the causes of performance. So for the uncertified and certified trains, the first eligibility uh, for that to happen uh, would occur on January 1st, beginning of this year. Uh, and then the disputed trains is uh, thir th you know, three uh, months later in April 1st of, of 2022. Next slide. Okay, so for, for section 213 of PREA, uh, it, it established the failure to meet uh, the minimum standard and, and, and what that process would look like. Um, a complaint can be filed uh, if the customer on time performance for any train averages less than 80% for two consecutive quarters, as I mentioned. And so the big question is uh, who can file this complaint? Um, so the STB themselves um, can initi initiate their investigation uh, on a standalone basis. Um, Amtrak can request an investigation. A host railroad themselves can and request it. And also an entity for which Amtrak operates inner city passenger rail, such as a state or, or multi-state agencies. And, and so we have been reaching out to these partners and keeping the communication lines open uh, so that we have their input uh, and that everybody knows what the performance of Amtrak trains are. So there are no surprises. And, and so if the STB does take that step and, and, and makes an investigation, they have the uh, ability to uh, recommend uh, improvement uh, to the service quality and on-time performance, as well as to award damages and, and prescribe other uh, relief as, as they see fit. 
Next slide, please. So the, the Surface Transportation Board, STB, um, they on uh, April of last year formed a passenger rail working group uh, led by uh, Neil Moyer uh, to beef up their resources in, in order to, to fulfill their obligation uh, with regard to, to providing these investigations and in, in looking at whether or not uh, Amtrak is uh, receiving uh, the preference that they are uh, entitled to, as well as looking in to see why we are not making the minimum standard, standard as established by the uh, final rule. Um, and so the STB, as I mentioned, also has the authority to award damages and prescribe other relief should uh, they determine that the uh, rail carrier was um, not providing Amtrak the, the priority that it uh, deserves under the law. Next slide, please. And so there is a US, uh, 49 US code 24302, uh, 24308, excuse me, um, that is in the statutory law that Amtrak shall receive preference over freight transportation in using a rail line junction or crossing. And so this has been on the books since uh, 1973, um, and Amtrak is entitled to receive preference. However, as many of you know, um, that may not always be uh, the case um, as, as we have seen incidences of uh, freight trains receiving um, priority over Amtrak. And so I'll show you an example of that uh, in another slide. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the, the threat of preference enforcement that's driving OTP. And this shows a timeline over the years um, where certain acts were uh, initiated or, or on the books and the corresponding um, customer on-time performance uh, throughout the years. And there it seems to be a correlation. I don't know if it's uh, actually been proven, but it's interesting that back in 1973, Congress enacted um, a law uh, to establish Amtrak's preference. And shortly thereafter, uh, customer on-time performance uh, shot up uh, to over 70%. Um, and then in 1979, you'll see that uh, the Department of Justice, which is the only entity authorized to enforce preference, um, they had their first and only case uh, back in 1979. And subsequently, uh, we saw an improvement of on-time performance after that. Back in the mid-2000s, uh, the Senate enacted legislation that uh, would become the Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act, uh, known, also known as PREA. And in, in 2008, uh, the on-time performance requirements were established, and there was a, a you know, corresponding increase in on-time performance that Amtrak enjoyed after that. Uh, sometime in 2014, there were some legal challenges uh, to that, and we saw a, a drop in, in customer on-time performance. Um, and then lastly, with the uh, publication of the final rule, um, we're hoping to see even a higher uh, a jump in, in on-time performance to over 80%. So we are, are monitoring that. We are not there. We're a little bit disappointed that we haven't seen more of a boost there, but um, uh, with your help uh, in, in more communication and in, in getting improvement in customer monitor performance, hopefully we'll, we'll reach those 80% minimum standards that we uh, deserve. Next standard. So our team uh, at Amtrak is analyzing the delay data. We're tracking customer on-time performance. We are documenting preference violations. And with all this information, we are, are, are compiling data for a potential investigation should um, the STB ask for it, uh, if Amtrak wants to initiate it, or if a state agency would uh, like to have that, we are keeping track of all that. Um, and the goal is for our, our group is to have improved performance of Amtrak trains. That's our ultimate goal. Um, with regard to preference and, and possible violations, uh, we keep track of incidences. And, and the one I have here, uh, you may not be able to read it, but there was an incident, and, it, and it's similar to other incidences uh, that we see, where Amtrak was delayed uh, an hour and a half 
uh, on a host railroad um, and they they were behind a stalled train um, and it was an emergency and it was moving slowly. And so Amtrak attempted to uh, contact the uh, host railroad dispatcher in order to get around the train. And, and so they were told they could not get around the train uh, at least two times when they had the opportunity to get around it. And we were forced to follow that train for hundreds of miles. Um, we brought that to the attention uh, of the certain host, and they recognized that uh, they could have made some better choices with their dispatchers. And so they coached their dispatchers and um, on on time performance in, in Amtrak's preference um, and, and took some corrective action. So we see this all the time, and we, and we do document these incidences where we can. Next uh, slide, please. All right, so the next two slides that, that I'm gonna show you are the most recent quarters, two quarters of on-time performance. Uh, one, the first slide here is the long distance services. And then the subsequent slide will be the um, state, to, state supported services. And what you'll see here is a lot of red. Um, and so the, the first quarter that we measured was October 1st of 2021 to uh, December 31st of 2021, that was uh, the, the one quarter. And then the second quarter is uh, that uh, ending in March 31st, 2022. And so are, <clears throat> are these services uh, meeting the minimum standard of 80%? No, they're not meeting that standard. And of course, this is by a, a service level. Individual trains are, are aggregated here. There may be a train or two that, that is uh, making the, the minimum standard, uh, but as the aggregate here, they are not. And so any of these trains here effective April 1st are eligible for um, the SDB to investigate there. The last column you'll see here is um, a, a, a year over year look at a freight train interference and uh, all of them except one train, the Cardinal has increased in, in freight train interference year over year. Um, so we're, we're not, this is not where we want to be. We want to have uh, move up into the green areas and have 80% minimum standard, but we have a long way to go here on, on long distance services. Um, next slide, please. So this is the state supported routes where we're seeing some green here. So uh, this is better news story with our, our state supported routes. Um, however, uh, seven of the 15 routes and services shown here are failing to meet the minimum standard. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we are reaching out to the state partners and you know, communicating the performance, getting their input, um, seeing if they can use their, their leverage with the host railroad um, in ways that we can improve performance on the services. Um, it, if you look at the last column here, uh, there is some significant increases in FTI traffic year over year. Uh, with the exception of the Down Easter and the Empire, which uh, had some decrease in, in FTI, which is great. Um, so next slide, please. Oh, that's it. That's the end of my presentation. So uh, Yoel and I will uh, take any questions that you may have, um, and, but we do appreciate you giving us this opportunity uh, to communicate with you and provide an update. Uh, and we look forward to any future communications if you'd like us to, to have uh, updates later on as well. Super. Elizabeth, thank you. Uh, and Yoel, we, we haven't heard from you yet, but <laughs> we're going to put you on the spot too. Uh, listen, I we have questions uh, from, from the audience. Uh, at, I'm going to exercise my CEO prerogative though, and I'm going to ask a couple of my own if that's okay. Um, the first thing I, I would like a little clarification on, um, it, whether a schedule is disputed or not, we are the the clock is is ticking right we are all keeping score yeah um, yep that's, yeah what i don't understand or, or it's not clear to me um if a complaint were to be made are would stb treat the disputed schedules differently than the undisputed schedules or is it kind of like well the deadline's passed and we're going to judge you on that yardstick whether you dispute it or not or do we actually know 
So Jim, we, we don't actually know because we haven't taken a case. Nobody's requested the STB to investigate and they haven't initiated one on their own. So it's unknown at this point how they will treat an investigation, but uh, we are looking forward to one soon. You know, uh, and then my other question before we go to the questions from, from the group. So uh, Joe, I apologize. I'm, I'm stealing a little bit of time here. Um, it's obvious that we have a, a, a problem with performance. Right? This is no secret. We've been tracking the data, you've been tracking the data. Um, and the, the law, the rule was pretty clear that there is eligible complainants, that's the term. Right. Um, in theory, we are not an eligible complainant as the association. On the other hand, um, we have been advised that we are perfectly able to aggregate our own data and forward that in, as information to the Service Transportation Board. And then someone else, probably the STB, would be free to initiate an investigation because they can initiate anyway on the basis of our information. So strictly speaking, it's not a formal complaint because we're not an eligible complainant, but we can certainly alert the STB that there's a problem. Um, we're a couple quarters in now, no one's asked for anything. Amtrak hasn't asked for anything. States haven't asked for anything. Um, is there a reason why you think as an association, we shouldn't ask? Because we've got folks out there that are, that are three, four five hours delayed. Um, and as an association, we would like to take some action. Well, I don't think anything precludes you from voicing your concerns um, through the channels that you have. Um, of course, Amtrak is looking at all these schedules and um, we are planning to uh, ask the SDB for an investigation on certain services. So we have that in the pipeline right now. Um, it's just a matter of, of weeks before that, that comes out. So, I mean, we, we do, you know, we are with you on, on that and we are seeking to improve performance uh, and the performance is not where it needs to be under the, the final rule. Okay, super. So I, I will, as the, as the saying goes, I will yield the balance of my time so that people can ask the questions they've teed up for the group here. But, uh, but thanks for that. Thank you, Jim. Uh, all right, so we have a we had a couple of email, uh, questions coming through email before the events. Um, so Steve Strauss, uh, executive director uh, of the Empire State Passenger Association up in New York, a uh, longtime advocate, a uh, longtime member of ours. So for a number of years, Amtrak resisted publicizing its host railroad scorecard. You preferred choir discussions with the freight rail uh, with the freight railroads. Now you've changed your mind and gone public with the ratings and encouraged folks to share that. Can you talk a, a bit about the change in thinking when it comes to that? Well, you know, I've only been at Amtrak for a year, but I think that uh, the past two years I've seen the public uh, reporting of the, the host railroad report card, which is on an annual basis. That does get the attention uh, of all parties uh, affected. Of course, nobody wants to have a bad grade and show your mom the, the report card that I made a D or an F, right? So they, they don't want to be last on there. And so we work with uh, the host railroads to, to see what we can do to mitigate the delays and to improve performance. So with each host, we are engaging at all levels to, to get that improved performance. I, you know, of course, we hear about challenges from the host railroads that you know, they have implemented a new operating practice that has proved uh, challenging for Amtrak trains, you know, the longer trains, uh, a lot of episodic events that, that are causing breakdowns on the line of road, uh, Amtrak having to follow these uh, long freight trains for, for many miles because the, the, you know, the trains don't uh, fit within the uh, infrastructure allowed on the route. So we have engaged, you know, engaged with conversations and, and communicated the performance, you know, on a weekly, uh, monthly, quarterly basis uh, at all levels. You know, we have communications at senior leaderships where they reach out to their counterparts uh, to try to get some engagement and, and, you know, some focus on our performance. So um, we, we are trying to, to get move that needle, but uh, this uh, final rule uh, and the minimum standard uh, is allowing us uh, to have a way to um, get that performance for underperforming trains. So we're looking forward to, to seeing some improvement as a result of a possible STB investigation. 
Yeah, I, and I'm like, uh, when I was in grade school, uh, you can't really, you know, try to change your grade. No, before the, it's out the, there. Work hard gets to your parents. You you can't, try, you know, scramble that D into a B. Uh, it's hard to do when it's when it's out there in the public. Um, so another question we had uh, from Jim Dexter, uh, one of our members, uh, was the rescheduling of the northbound crescent part of a negotiated attempt? You, you mentioned, you know, the, the difference of the, the, the authorized schedules. Uh, was it a negotiated attempt to improve the train's timekeeping? Uh, if so, has it worked? If not, is there a possibility of restoring a former schedule, uh, which is more, much more conductive to travel to and from Atlanta, the train's biggest market outside the Northeast? Well, yeah, I'll let UL uh, speak to that since he was uh, knee deep in the uh, negotiation of that train schedule change. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. So, yeah, that's actually uh, a negotiation that we held with uh, with Norfolk Southern uh, and actually pretty intense intensely from uh, August of 2020 through about April of 2021, where we finally got to an agreement and then were able to implement uh, the new schedule in the beginning of June. And as you had indicated, we added 90 minutes uh, to each train. Um, and in exchange for that, we got some financial certificate. Uh, um, uh, backing from NS that they would perform or they would be paying penalties. Uh, and so what we saw was uh, the first few months, we actually saw some improved performance. Uh, we actually had, I think October was the month that we peaked, that we were in the mid 70s for customer on time performance. So not quite at 80 percent, but but not too far off, certainly trending in the right direction. Uh, we then saw uh, and, you know, you can look at the numbers just as easily as we can. Uh, we then saw kind of the, the wheels kind of come off um, and, and right around uh, starting, you know, Thanksgiving into Christmas. Um, I, I think we saw February was it was a bit of an improvement, but it's been going down ever since. Uh, and so we're very disappointed and we've had conversations with NS that we are very disappointed that essentially all we've done is add 90 minutes to the train. But if you compare May um, customer on time performance this year compared to last year, it's pretty close. They're both kind of in the low 30 percentile. So that's really not where we want to be. Uh, now, NS has told us that they've, they've uh, kind of rebuilt their scheduling system. Um, and, and they have this new operating plan that just went into effect. And so they're anticipating improved performance. So we'll be monitoring. We'll be seeing how that happens. Uh, but we do have the opportunity, as does NS, either side can uh, end the, um, the new schedule. Uh, with 90 days notice and we would then revert back to the old schedule so that that option is there so far neither side has executed excellent uh, and actually I have a very timely and that and that um question actually came in through email about, a, about two weeks ago so very timely and actually it was it was it was covered here um so uh sean jeans gale our our vp uh he's he's hiding behind the screen there i uh, actually had a, a a question that he pulled uh freight railroads focus on operating ratios has led to limited capital investment inhibited capacity growth in the rail industry hurt service for shippers and hurt service for passengers. How can Amtrak differentiate between bad dispatching practices and a terminal decline in capacity and network velocity? That was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's break that one up. Um, yeah. And so, as I mentioned before, you know, we we hear from the freight railroads, you know, they're, they're changing in, uh, operating plans um, that have occurred over the past five, 10 years. Um, we are, are, you know, we try to educate them so that they can educate and reach out to their dispatchers and to make the, the choices that are per the law and per now the final rule to make that 80% minimum standard. So we, we try to educate them so that they can educate their, you know, their own workforce to make better decisions. Um, you, you know, with the, the goal of, of, you know, all organizations uh, that are uh, private entities to their, you know, they have obligations to their shareholders. And a, a lot of that new operating practice change involved, you know, re, you know, involved the holy grail of getting that operating ratio down and, and being and be in first, right? Nobody wants to be last in their operating ratio under that operating plan. That was to see who can beat everybody else. But, but with that operating practice with the longer trains, um, the heavier trains and the, uh, you know, the pulling of um, assets out of the system like locomotives, uh, you know, they sweat the assets and, and so there's less reliable 
locomotives that may be out there. But I mean, we, what the result is what we're seeing is uh, frequent breakdowns uh, and Amtrak having to follow these trains and, and sometimes incurring delays, uh, you know, over two hours at, a, at an instance when that occurs. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're engaged with discussions with them, and, you know, and, and getting, you know, your members and uh, the people on, on this webinar, if they have a voice to, to raise that voice to, to, to who they can to ensure that, that Amtrak receives its statutory preference uh, over freight. Um, and so that's all we're after is good performance of our trains. I mean, we wouldn't have to have the conversation, I guess, if, if we were receiving that now, but um, I hope that answered the question. Uh, Sean, you have uh, any follow-up uh, for, for your question? Well, I, I saw one of our members, uh, John Webb out in California. He had a more, I think, on the, on the nose version of the question, which is, can you Amtrak comment on the events, uh, the effects of recently implemented the operational policy of three mile long freight trains? And, you know, freight trains being longer than sidings. Um, that's obviously gonna affect network velocity. I, you, bad dispatching, you know, there's, there's, I think, an STB remedy there. Um, I'm just wondering where, this is where being in government affairs and policy, I'm wondering what the remedy, what leverage we have as passengers and as advocates over freight trains, um, where some of these operational choices are just gonna decrease, <laughs> decrease network velocity and, and you know, leave us kind of stuck at the station. If we're well, I would say if the infrastructure, you know, is the same, you know, as it was in 1970, and now the operating practice is to outsize, you know, the trains outsize that infrastructure, you know, trains averaging uh, 200 cars or, you know, 15,000 feet long, the sidings that they have from a long time ago were under 10,000 feet. When, when a host launches uh, their train, Amtrak is not going to receive preference automatically that freight train is going to receive it from origin into destination and so you know if if the operating practice could be changed for those routes that um you know the freight trains don't fit in the sidings can we have the freight trains in those incidents instance shorten their train up to to where they can get in the siding and let amtrak pass i mean that that would be a help i have to step in and, and agree very very strongly um you know, what, one thing that I hear this a lot as we discuss this with, with hosts as well as with, with uh, federal agencies and even with Congress, this idea that, well, you know, this is the three mile freight train and this is what they have to do. Well, it's an operational practice that is contrary to what is provided in the law. I mean, not to be, be absolutist about it, but the answer that says, well, we have to do that to be profitable. What other business can say, well, yeah, it's against the law, but we're going to do this because this is how we're profitable. You know, there are plenty of banks that have tried that as an excuse and found themselves on the wrong end of, of a regulatory action, right? You, you can't just adopt an operational practice because it's ideal for you, but it violates the law. And in this instance, that practice violates the law. And so I, I think if, at least in, until we can get longer sightings built, we ought to have shorter trains, period, done. And I, that's very absolutist. And I suppose it's easy for me to say, sitting here as the you know, DC CEO of the association, but it seems fairly obvious to me from a policy point of view, until the law says you can run a three mile train, you can't do it. We'll see what the STB has to say. Uh, again, we, we haven't yet taken a case to the STB. We, th we think we're close. We have to see how you know what the, what they'll investigate, what they'll conclude, what remedies they'll uh, you know they'll seek. So we, we we just don't know yet, but we absolutely agree with you because you know we we're, we're fighting this every day. Just long trains that don't fit in the siding, so Amtrak has to take the has to take the siding, or it's such a long train that it breaks down, knuckles break, drawbars break, uh, and now and and crew bases actually. They don't have as many, they're, they're spread further out than they used to be. So not only do you have a long train that's broken down, but now it takes longer to get to that train to make the fix. So it takes longer to get that train up and running and you know the customers are uh, on Amtrak trains are suffering. Exactly right. As, as a follow-up to that, um, and I know that there hasn't been uh, any STB, but as you, you, know, you said, you guys are close. Um, is there any thoughts 
on, and or maybe you guys can speak to it, maybe not, uh, from Amtrak's side, what these this relief could look like in the future. Once, once a case is brought, what once it goes through it and then the findings, is it like how could that benefit our, our members, people watching, like you know, going forward in the future, what could we be looking for po like kind of post these investigations? Any idea? Well, I mean, to 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 satisfy that question we we're just talking about, perhaps the STB can uh, you know order that the the host railroad build the sidings to match their operation, right? That would I think improve uh, the ability for Amtrak to get around, receive uh, preference that is entitled to, and to improve the performance. So that's just one of a possible many that that could be done by the STB. Excellent. Um, so we have another question. Uh, Dan Bilka, one of us who's who's watching, uh, one of our uh, board of directors, um, he wants to know: uh, in dispatcher training for host railroads, or indeed for all railroad operations, are there requirements to cover Amtrak's legal right of preference, um, and what dispatching solutions exist to mu uh, mitigate these disruptions? So my understanding from the freight railroads, they, they train their dispatchers so that they're aware that Amtrak is, is supposed to have preference. Uh, where it gets uh, interesting is that, uh, you know, I, I, different hosts define preference in different ways. Uh, and, and so, it, again, that creates a bit of a gray area, uh, you know, and so sometimes we may hear from a host that, well, it was a choice of a freight train that their crew was about to expire on hours of service, which would have caused huge congestion and lots of delays for many trains, including Amtrak, or letting that train go first, and then Amtrak, the most immediate Amtrak train, having to suffer the delay waiting for the freight train to go first. So, again, what we hear, what we hear from the from the freight railroads. Uh, we have a question from um, Johan Moore, one of our members on Florida. Um, just uh, on the advocacy side, um, you know, they, you know we, we have a voice, you know, these uh, are all passengers, we, we have a voice here. While we might not be able to bring a case um, to the SDB, what, like, what can we do uh, to sort of like, not pressure, but help you all uh, when, it, when it comes to that? Well, I think you're, you have an important role in advocacy and in getting that message out that what Amtrak is entitled to uh, you have a better reach out there that I'm sitting here in Washington, D.C., but you guys are everywhere out there where where the, the trains are operating. So talk to your, uh, you know, your congressmen or your mayors, uh, let them know of, of what Amtrak is supposed to receive and we're not receiving it. Um, and, and spreading that message uh, helps out tremendously. Um, I want to just jump on that really quickly, too. As I said at the beginning, um, and I'm, this will be a little wonky, but it's probably worthwhile to answer the question. Um, the law, the, the regulation defines a certain group of what are called eligible complainants. That's the, the, the term of art. And states are eligible complainants. Amtrak is an eligible complainant. A host railroad is an eligible complainant. Um, a, a, a transit authority, a, a regional authority would also be an eligible complainant. Um, so we actually asked during the, the rule drafting process to make us an eligible complainant, and they said no. Um, however, um, as I said at the beginning, there is nothing stopping us from uh, sending an informational package to the STB on behalf of our members. We've done it for years. We, we do it all the time. The STB logs those. Is that a formal complaint? No. Is it a piece of information that the STB can use to potentially initiate its own investigation? Yeah, sure it is. And we would absolutely plan to do that. So certainly, in I don't want to call it informal because that's, I think that does it a disservice. We are keeping score, we are keeping track, and we are preparing, um, you know, letters slash filings to the Service Transportation Board in areas where we think it's the most egregious. So um, is that official? No. Would it be useful? I suspect yes. Jim, if I could just jump in, uh, we will be sending out a, um, a, a form, a tool web-based that allows passengers to communicate their stories of being delayed on a train as part of the summary of this webinar. And we're gonna try to get that out 
please help circulate that to your friends. I know that um, in Congress, when we hear when we have rail hearings where freight rail uh, are sitting before elected officials, blocked crossings is a, a huge issue that always comes up and it's because drivers who are trying to commute are very vocal. That is the ranked ordering of, of priorities in, in American transportation politics. It's drivers always come top of the feeding chain and but they're vocal about it. And so if we, I think if passengers yell a lot, um, eventually members of Congress will step in and say, why, why am I hearing about this? I need, I need the host railroads to solve this because I don't want to have to step in and deal with this. So uh, we have a couple more questions uh, from, the, from the chat. Um, Kim Whitmore, uh, working out with Big Sky in Montana and one of our council members out in California. Uh, has there been any movement, and this is actually kind of like for everybody, uh, has there been any movement on, on or progress with Congressional pa Rail Passenger Acts, uh, like a passenger bill of rights? Um, should there be a financial consequences for egregious delays, thinking like how airline implications after two hours from push, something like that. But like, can, can you speak to like, you know, Sean, Jim, anybody like for, you know, for the Passenger Bill of Rights to kind of help alleviate a lot, a lot of this? Sean, you want to go first? Well, we, yes, we have pushed for a number of um, quality of life improvements uh, as part of the IIJA, the bipartisan um, bill that just passed. Some of them include um, obviously food and beverage. Uh, we have, you know, coach access to the diner. Um, <clears throat> I think you raise a very good point, and I don't think it's we've we've necessarily framed it this way. We've we've certainly said um, passengers have a right to on time service. Has been our it's been one of the central planks of, of this entire on-time performance campaign and, and in addressing the STB and all those filings and letters Jim's mentioned. Um, I think you make a good point that uh, again, that it's it's it would be worthwhile to to kind of package that <clears throat> in a single kind of bill of rights and and organize around it. Um, I don't think it's something that we've necessarily considered. Uh, um, framing in that specific way but but I, but I like it me too that's easy <laughs> anyone else So actually, so and then, so the, it kind of gets back to our, our main topic um, from Ron Kamakal out in Nevada, um, longtime advocate, uh, union brother. Um, so the problem is not just siding length. Uh, PSR and its long trains are not appropriate for congested outdated terminals uh, like Elko, Nevada. Uh, we can suggest that sidings be extended and terminal length be extended, but this could take years to possibly build out. In the meantime, it seems that the only solution is to enforce limits on train length itself. Um, any thoughts? Well, I know we are seeing a lot of delays uh, near that Elko yard. Uh, the yard tracks there are not sufficiently long enough to accommodate an entire train. So there is a lot of work on the main line uh, to get that, break that train up and get it into the yard. Meanwhile, uh, Amtrak is impacted ne negatively with delays there as we have to wait, right? That's a big pinch point of uh, uh, delays there for for our passengers um, there. So, you all, I don't know if you have any additional color to add on that one. No, I I, I agree with you. That you know, you mentioned Elko Yard. That's an area that, uh, especially since the beginning of the year, we've just seen uh, delays increase uh, significantly for the trains uh, to the point where we're actually being routed through the yard uh, as they're finding that that's a quicker way to get us around. Uh, because their trains are so long, they can't do all the yard work in the yard, and they're actually on the main. So, um, you know, th it, these are issues that we face. And, and uh, you, you know, again, we talked to UP about it, but I think it'll be areas that we can address in, in when we submit for STB investigations to kind of point these these issues out. Because, you know, at least from where I sit, my opinion is very blatant. You know, it's not something that happened once; it's something that's happening regularly. Yeah, and actually, uh, so Ron actually just in the chat to me uh, as follow up, he said our train, the, their trains go through the yard, and this is a dangerous situation on, on a daily basis uh, because of the backups. Um, so 
I think uh, is, unless uh, Jim, Sean, if you have any uh, further questions, you kind of take uh, the prerogative here, you know, executive, uh, you know, to ask anything else. Uh, I think we are wrapping up with the chats. I I, uh, I I don't. I think we've we've uh, hit the highlights here. And my my main objective, we get so many emails and questions and comments and social media and all the rest on what's metrics and standards. Why should I care about metrics and standards? And and I thought it was important to to really spend the time with everyone here to to kind of lay that out. Um, and we now have some work ahead of us. I think a passenger bill of rights is an excellent way to focus our energy on really getting this, getting after this, this issue. Um, so I, I did, before we, we close, uh, I did want to just make mention of um, our thoughts about the, uh, the terrible derailment on the Southwest Chief. Uh, I, I hope that uh, everyone thinks of the families, of the crews, of the uh, first responders, uh, you know, I used to be a firefighter. I was a firefighter paramedic for 13 years. I know what it's like to be on these scenes. Um, it's a difficult time for everyone. And it's really easy. I've seen it already in social media, people speculating on how it happened, why it happened, whose fault it is, and, and all the rest. And we'll know in due time. Uh, I think it would be really, uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't encourage everyone to take a breath, Think about the families, think about the first responders, think about the crews, think about the train crews, and go back and realize that overall train travel remains an extraordinarily safe way to, to get across the country. Uh, the, the details on derailments, on injuries, on accidents, on, on fatalities, it's very clear from the numbers that despite this horrific wreck, Overall, Amtrak remains a very, very safe way for people to travel. And I don't want people to lose sight of that fact. Uh, but that's, I, I did want to make sure that everyone joins with me uh, in thinking about uh, all of those families that have been affected by this. Uh, certainly we've been affected by it. And, uh, and uh, if, you, if you would please keep them in your thoughts, we would certainly appreciate that. And that's really all I have to say on that topic, Joe. All right. Uh, well, so on 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 that you know, so, so more somber and important, very important notes. Uh, I want I want to thank um, you, Jim, uh, Elizabeth, uh, you all, uh, Sean, for for answering questions. I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. Uh, let me share my screen one last time. Um, so we are not going to have a, a, a webinar next month. Uh, we are we are taking July off. Uh, we will be back. Uh, in August, um, we will be uh, we will be joining Big Sky out in, in Billings, Montana, uh, for their big event, and uh, we our plans are to actually bring our next webinar uh, to you all live uh, from Montana while we're there. Um, but I wanted to uh, just you know if you enjoy uh, these events and you know talk about you know Sean and Jim mentioned you know pushing for potential passenger bill of rights, uh, the best way you can do that is to join us, uh, to support us, uh, railpassengers.org slash join or donate uh, or to our store uh, to buy some, some of our, 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 license, our branded gear. Uh, but with that, I thank you all for joining us. Um, have a safe, wonderful uh, 4th of July holiday th this weekend, and uh, we will see you again in August.